Now, if, uh, if you look at the cross-section of these cells they, and compare it with a cat tail cell, they look very closely related. So, you know, they are close cousins. They essentially have the same set of layers. So, you know, both of them could be grown on glass or they could be grown on uh, aluminum foil. They have uh, a cadmium sulfide, uh, cadmium sulfide window layer which acts as a selective contact. And in one case, the absorber is uh, cadmium terlite. In another case, the absorber is uh, sig. So you got away with some of the problems uh, with you know with the cadmium being poisonous and so on, toxic and so on. So you know you can calm ask those people to calm down, but they won't. You know they say okay over here you also have a cadmium sulfide layer, so you know that's still poison, that's still toxic. So you can say okay that we're using a very small amount of that. It's only a thin absorber layer. So you can calm some of their concern. Another thing is sterilium is, uh, as we, as I mentioned last time, it's a rare element and uh, 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 there are concerns whether there will be enough availability of that. So some of those concerns are also satisfied uh, with SIG. The one difference between SIGs uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, CATTER is that this one uses a copper contact versus uh, SIG cells, they mostly use a moly, molybdenum contact. And molybdenum contact is, uh, is uh, you know, it's typically, it's sputtered when you are done depositing your absorber layer. Or if you are growing it on the glass, you can sputter it first as well. And it's a good choice because uh, these are refractory metals, you know, tungsten, molybdenum are refractory metals. They don't diffuse into your uh, semiconductor much. So these are preferred for making uh, contacts to especially amorphous or polycrystal materials so they don't diffuse in much once you uh, once you subject it to some thermal budget afterwards <coughs> okay another thing is that people try to grow these layers on uh, they try to grow it on either glass or they try to grow it on aluminum last time i showed you that video where they were trying to grow it on a sheet of aluminum and uh, trying to process these cells so the reason why glass is preferred in some cases is that these uh, glasses are essentially what is called a soda lime glass. No, it's not a, it's not, it reminds you of lime soda, but it, it, it's so called because it has some amount of sodium in it, which is really helpful while you grow these uh, materials. So it helps in increasing the crystallinity of your material. So this is the picture of uh, this uh, a cross section SEM picture of your CIGS layer without sodium. And this is with sodium, so you can see that the you can see bigger grains, much well defined. You know, all of them look crappy. Both of them look crappy, but one is less crappier than other. So because it has larger grains, which uh, come due to some magic property of sodium, which helps uh, in this growth. So people, some of the manufacturers still prefer to grow it on uh, glass. For example, Solendra, it has those uh, glass tubes or there are some other manufacturers that still prefer to grow it on glass because they think you can get a better quality of uh, these layers uh, when you grow it on glass. Okay. So now, all these startups that I mentioned, right, Nano Solar, uh, Stein, AKT, and, you know, plethora of those startups, all of these startups, you know, what their, their unique uh, IP or their, how they differentiate versus other, is that they essentially are process startups, so not even process startup, but they essentially have uh, one unique thing that is how to deposit this absorber layer. And each of them has its own different uh, recipe or uh, own specific method of uh, depositing this uh, CIGS material. So as I mentioned that you, know, you have these four elements, so it's very difficult to uh, deposit all four of them. And uh, if you are doing it in a lab and you want to demonstrate the best efficiency cells, then you would, you would, you would do a evaporation of these four different elements and you would do it under a very low vacuum, which is good for demonstrating it in a lab, but it's not good for an industrial process. So what is more commonly used in the industry is that you sputter these elements in a low vacuum. And a lot of the companies such as, you know, Stein or even other startups, they, or AKT or other startups, they, they are all essentially, they use this method of sputtering these elements. So they have four different targets, one with copper, one with indium, one with helium, one with selenium. 
and you essentially go sputter them or sometimes you sputter two or three of them at one time and you sputter the other one after that and then you do some annealing for them to mix with each other right so that's uh, one way of doing it the other way to do it is uh, print them you know deposit uh, essentially print a ink or print uh, uh, the CIGS uh, material in the form of an ink and the video I showed you last time from a startup uh, nano solar they exactly do this so they take an ink of CIGS and print it over and then again I need it to hopefully give them good quality material and then you know the also basically there are all these different kind of methods and you should take into account uh, when you compare one versus another that uh, what vacuum are you operating at if you do this process at high vacuum then you would be slow but you'll have good you won't have contaminants like oxygen carbon getting incorporated into your cell if you do it under atmospheric pressure you'll get a lot of oxygen a lot of carbon and those are bad things for yourself. So <clears throat> each of these startups is, in fact, uh, a tool startup or a process startup where they develop this proprietary tool and process to essentially deposit this uh, CIGS layer. So, so this is one way of doing it. You can uh, sputter these different uh, four elements. So you can sputter your indium, gallium, and selenium at the same time. And copper, it has a different uh, different conditions for you know sputtering as compared to the other three. So you spa stop the sputtering of indium and gallium, and then you sputter your carbon, and then you anneal it. And hopefully, what you assume is that they'll, the these elements have high diffusivity at least within each other, so they diffuse very easily till they form the CIGS layer. So again, the sputtering is, uh, of these things is not an easy thing. You can't like sputter all four of them at the same time because they have very different uh, conditions at which they evaporate. So you sputter at maximum two or three of them, and then you sputter the other one, and then you mix them together. <coughs> the other process, so you know, uh, this was a company which was uh, doing that process. It was recently bought by, I think, uh, a Chinese company. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, it was uh, a very promising company back in 2010, and it has demonstrated this efficiency of uh, uh, again uh, 13 or 14 percent. And again, once you people talk about efficiency of thin film solar cells, you should always ask them what is the area of the cell because these things are very readily affected by grain boundary. So you can find a very small cell which has no grain boundary, or you know, which has very uh, met, you know very meticulously search for a small area which gives you a very high efficiency but it doesn't scale well on a large uh, large size set so this is uh, another company this is from uh, nano solar and we talked about them so they essentially have this uh, aluminum sheet which they are very quickly flowing or essentially pulling out uh, between their different tools and each of these tools is depositing one layer of material and they deposit their uh, their CIGS material in the form of the ink. So when it's first deposited, it looks like these nanoparticles. And this is no good for making a solar cell because you know, these are individual particles. There'll be a lot of recombination in them. But then afterward, they essentially anneal it, and uh, it turns out to be of a decent quality. But again, controlling the quality of this material would be very difficult over here because this is a non-vacuum process. There will be all other things which would get incorporated. The purity of the ink is again debatable. So, uh, but at least they claim that you know they can pull out this sheet of aluminum at a very high speed. So they can essentially take this roll of aluminum and they can pull it out, or they can uh, roll it through their uh, their uh, solar printing press at 100 feet per minute, and uh, that could essentially give you a very large, at least capacity number for your factory if you are producing panels at that rate. <coughs> so if, if it is, but if, if they try to sell it like that, the efficiencies are very poor because you know, there will be grain somewhere. So it, the entire sheet is yes one cell, but what they do is after they print them, they break it down into smaller cells. Then they bin them, you know, find out the the good sheep and the black sheep and the bad sheep and you know, accordingly uh, take the panel, take the cells which are better 
and then use them, uh, you know, just like you do in your project, bin the cell and then make panel out of it. In principle, yes, you can sell the whole thing as a panel, but the efficiency is really poor because there will be some part which we, would, would be really bad and it would degrade the efficiency of the whole, whole set. What is the So I've heard different numbers. Somebody told me it's like 10%, which is really bad. But uh, uh, yield is a it's a concern for these cells. So I don't know the exact number either. <coughs> so one of the concern with at least uh, uh, cattle was the non-availability of uh, terrain. But if you look at the elements which are used to make CIGS cells, so gallium, indium especially, they're also not, uh, uh, especially indium, it's not very widely available as well. So what some people say is that even CIGS will have a problem in terms of uh, you know, achieving a terawatt capacity. It's not clear whether it will, you know, even it would be required at a terawatt level. But in fact, if you if you are planning, you should plan for you know my technology will scale up to a terawatt level. So people say that it does not have sufficient reserve to uh, to essentially achieve that uh, capacity. Again, these things are highly debatable because few years back people used to say we don't have enough terillium. Then you found ores of terillium in somewhere. People say that you know there are not enough petroleum. Then you find shale gas somewhere else. So it's it's always these things are debatable, but. Nonetheless, they say, let's, let's get rid of uh, indium and let's form a cell with these other elements which are more abundant. So copper, of course, is more abundant. Zinc, uh, you know, you use pans made of copper and zinc, so those are well abundant. Tin is well abundant. You are using it, you know, soldering things. Uh, sulfur is well abundant. So this, this new technology called CZTS, which uses uh, these four more abundant elements, and uh, there are a few groups at Stanford who work on these as well. So it's a, again a close cousin of CIGS, but you get rid of indium and gallium, which are rare. <coughs> so then, you know, I was asking somebody, you know, why have we only explored solar cells on these materials like amorphous silicon or cattle or CIGS or organic material? I mean, there could be so many other semiconductors which would be, you know, fitting to make uh, solar cells as well. So it turns out there was, you know, back uh, in the 1980s or 90s, there was a uh, there was a conscious decision made by the U.S. government funding agency. There was a budget crunch, so they decided, you know, let's pick the candidates which look more promising at that time. So they picked up cattle, figs, and uh, amorphous silicon to fund, but. Uh, you know, there are other elements which you hopefully, you know, if you're a material scientist, you can find which are good. The thing you need are that it should be a good uh, uh, good absorber, so you can make thin films of it. It should be relatively cheap. And, you know, the rest are technological issues. But there could be other these other these materials which are which we so far don't know which could be a good candidate for uh, uh, thin film technology as well. What we now know is not a very good candidate, and there was a lot of excitement in this uh, again back in 2007 to 2010 fine frame when polycrystalline prices were up, and a lot of people were interested in using amorphous silicon because it's a much better, it has a high absorption coefficient, so you can use a much thinner amount of material. But the efficiencies of these cells were uh, never, they, you know, they never exceeded even the lab for champion devices, they never exceeded more than 13%. Uh, and it has other plethora of problems which I'll just talk about. So if, so before I talk about it, let me show you some uh, numbers and let me ask that same question that I had asked before, that uh, I have these two configurations of cell possible. So in the case of amorphous silicon, band gap is higher but the asymmetry in the mobility is higher as well. So I have electron mobility of 20, while the whole mobility is just 2, right? Versus silicon, which at the best has electron mobility of 1300, whole mobility of 400. So the asymmetry between them is 3 is to 1. Over here, the asymmetry is 10 is to 1, right? So among these two configurations, which, which you would you prefer to make the cell?
left one. Okay, and the reason me. Okay, light is absorbed here, generates electron and all there. Oh, sorry. The hole has to be adjusted. Okay. Okay. Does, does everybody agree with that? So you want the carrier with the higher mobility to travel more, the carrier with the lower mobility to travel less. So almost universally for amorphous silicon, this is the configuration where you have uh, PIN, where P type is facing the facing the incoming line. 